Um, we are going to continue our looking and studying the Gospel of Mark. So if you want to get your Bibles out, I have loved going through a book of the Bible and walking through systematically because it, it sort of forces you to encounter what God wants to say in His Word. And what God is saying. I know uh, when we were going through the book of Colossians uh, several months back, there were, there were times on Monday morning when I would set out to study the next passage and I would think to myself, is there any way I could skip this section? <laughs> and thankfully, you know, I thought, well, no, so there, people are going to notice if we skip this. And so God, you know, we, God speaks to us through his word, even when we aren't naturally maybe inclined to talk about particular things. So I'm very excited to continue. We're in Mark chapter 2, and last week in our verses, we saw the Pharisees. These are sort of the religious leaders of the day. They were criticizing Jesus and kind of more or less picking apart everything he's doing. And last week, the reason they were criticizing him, it sort of changes and morphs throughout the gospel of Mark, but they were criticizing him because he was eating with sinners. He was eating with sinners. Now, obviously, we know that everyone has sinned. The Bible says all have sinned, and we know that in, intuitively. Nobody is perfect. But these were people who were especially known and labeled in their culture as sinners. Now, speaking of labels, something came out at our life group this past week. And by the way, if you're not in a life group, I would really encourage you to get in one because we, we talk about the verses in our life groups and discuss how does this apply. We go deeper in our lives, and that has been so transformative for me personally. So if you're not in one, Get in one, go to our website, come talk to me, um, and be in a life group. But in our life group, it came out that, that the Pharisees, when they looked at these people, what did they see? Tax collectors and sinners. That's what they saw. In other words, they saw the person's profession, and they saw all the mistakes that they had made. That was their identity. Oh, you're a tax collector and you're a sinner, but it says when Jesus walked by and looked over at Levi, what did Jesus see? Mark chapter 2, verse 14, he saw Levi. That was so profound to me, and I couldn't shake that. I, th I thought about that all week, because when Jesus looks at you, he does not see your job. Whether it's a new job, an old job, you've been laid off from a job, he doesn't see that. He doesn't see your failures. He sees you, who God made you to be. That is so encouraging to me. But the Pharisees couldn't see this. They didn't understand this, and so they criticized Jesus. But notice Jesus, rather than apologizing for being near sinners, you know how when you sense the disapproval of someone else, especially if they are influential people, you maybe are tempted to like, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll go away from the sinners. I'll come stand by you guys. Jesus doesn't do anything close to that. In fact, he uses it as an opportunity to, to proclaim and, and, and clarify his mission. Guys, not only is it not weird that I'm hanging out with these people, this is why I came. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician. We get that. But those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I came not for those who have it all together, but those who know they need me. That's who I came for. And by the way, that is a very important distinction to recognize. That when Jesus came and said these words, I came not to call the righteous but sinners. I don't think we should picture Jesus assigning labels to people in the room. And the reason I say that is because you could imagine Jesus coming over to the Pharisees and being like, hey, guys, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call this, those sinners. I don't think Jesus did that. What Jesus was doing was, was just putting out these two options and allowing people in the room to self-identify. You know the expression, if the shoe fits, wear it. I think that's what he is doing because Jesus, when he said this, most of the Pharisees would have quickly identified as what? Righteous. Oh yeah, that's us. He's, he's talking about us here. I'm righteous. They're the sinners. But then there were other people in the room who would have instantly thought, well, I know I'm not righteous. Jesus is righteous. I know I'm not. And then they would have begun to put it together and say, I, I suppose that makes me a, a sinner. I suppose I need Jesus. See? Jesus was just putting that out there so that we could identify for ourselves, do I personally need the life-changing grace of Jesus? Do you need that? Or is it something that we just sort of think of theoretically as being good for other people? 
But now we are continuing in Mark chapter 2, and the further that we get into Mark, the more contrast we see between the Pharisees and Jesus. The contrast between Jesus moving toward people, being close to people that society had ostracized, and the Pharisees moving, what? Away. Getting as far from those people as possible. We see another contrast between the attitude of Jesus and the people and all that God is doing. There's healing and there's forgiveness and there's, it's just this amazement and excitement. And do the Pharisees, is that their posture? No, they're annoyed. They're irritated. They're grumpy. They're accusing Jesus. So this contrast continues this morning where we pick up in Mark chapter 2. And so if you join me, Mark 2, 18 is where we're going to read. We're going to read three sections going into chapter 3. Mark 2.18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Notice right away, contrast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. We're going to talk about that in a bit. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. By the way, how many have come home with a pair of pants that fit perfectly until you washed it? (laughs) That's what he's talking about here. And, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed. And so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. The next episode. Verse 23. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did? When he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to the Pharisees, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, is Lord even of the Sabbath. The third episode in chapter 3, again he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand. And he watched, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. There is a popular movie out there and one of the most well-known lines is, wow, that escalated quickly. It's not important whether or not you know the movie, but the point is that in the beginning of this passage, there's this conversation about fasting and by the end, they are plotting to kill Jesus. That escalated quickly. And Jesus calls them out for this. I love this. In, in um, the end there, chapter 3, verse 5, he says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? Let's answer that question right now. Yes, good. Anybody with a brain stem can figure that out, right? And these are the religious leaders. It is better to do good. God would say that. Is it better to save life or to kill? Save life. You know what Jesus is doing here? He is calling them out because They are criticizing and accusing Jesus because he is doing good for a man. He is healing a man. And meanwhile, in their hearts, Jesus knows they're plotting to kill him. So they're murderers. (laughs) And he is saying, who do you think God approves of in this moment? Me trying to do good or you trying to kill me? 
They know the answer, so they actually don't answer. They quietly just sit there, and despite the fact that they have a front row seat to this amazing new work of God, of healing and forgiveness, and the love of God being poured out on people, they're not amazed. They're not excited, they're disturbed, they're irritated, and now, actually, they want to kill Jesus. They want to get rid of him. And this escalation starts with a conversation about fasting. And what happens is people look around and they see John's disciples fasting. And they see the Pharisees' disciples fasting. And so basically anybody uh, who's anybody in the religious world is fasting. And they come to Jesus and they say, why aren't you fasting, Jesus? You don't seem very religious. Now Jesus could have responded here, by the way. He could have said, fasting is a waste of time. Don't bother me with this pointless religious tradition. We're not doing that anymore. But notice he doesn't do that. In these verses, Jesus never disputes the validity or the value of fasting or Sabbath, for that matter. Think about Jesus. What did he do for 40 days in the wilderness? He fasted. And that's why he says there will come a day when the disciples will fast. It's, it's of value. So it's, there's nothing wrong with fasting. The issue was with timing. Look at what he says in ni verse 19. Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they'll fast in that day. Now you may wonder here, which I wondered, what in the world does this have to do with fasting? What, 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 what is Jesus talking about? Well, we know from Scripture that Jesus is the bridegroom. He is the groom of the church. The church are the bride. We are the bride. We are his bride. And so we see this in a few places, many places, but here's a few. Ephesians 5, 25. Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives as, he fill in the blank, Christ loved the church. And he continues to talk about husbands and wives, but at the end he says, I'm really talking about Christ and the church. Christ is the groom. We are the bride. Paul takes it a step further with his language in 2 Corinthians 11 when he says, I feel divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband. Who's the husband? Jesus. To present you, the people, as a pure virgin to Christ. Pretty vivid language. And when you fast forward to the end of this time, Revelation chapter 19, you don't find us fasting, you find us feasting. <laughs> In the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it says there's this crowd proclaiming the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. So right there we can see the metaphors that Jesus is using related to weddings and marriage, but it still doesn't help us understand fasting unless you understand how weddings were done in this day and in this culture. You see, in our day, we have maybe like, what, a two-hour, three-hour event on a Saturday, or maybe some people are like, I'm skipping that, we're eloping, um, you know what I mean? And in this culture, weddings, rather than a couple hours, they were a week-long, festive, joyous event, and they were so important that, this, this shocked me when I read it this week, that the religious leaders would actually declare during these weeks of celebration that, that joy and celebration was more important than observing religious rituals. Did you get that? I got a little respect back for the scribes this week. Because they would make this declaration that, that if the observance of any law got in the way of having a good time and celebrating at this wedding, you could put that aside during the celebration. And so what this means, by using this illustration, Jesus is saying two things. He's saying, first of all, I am not just a religious teacher. I'm not just here to annoy you or mess with your traditions. I am the Messiah and the bridegroom of the church of God. He's identifying himself this way. But the second thing he is saying when he identifies himself as the church is whenever I am with them, which I am, there should only be joy. There should be celebration. There's no reason to be fasting because this is a celebration. We're together. And that's the point of, of what he is saying here. But he says, when I leave, they're going to fast. And we know that is true because when you read the book of Acts, Jesus has just left and the early church is fasting and praying and seeking God. 
And something fascinating really hit me this week, and this is powerful. I imagine Jesus, what is Jesus doing now? Well, after Jesus ate and drank with the disciples in Matthew chapter 26, this is the end of his time on earth, right after the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, and he says this in verse 29, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Translation, Jesus is fasting for you and for me. Jesus himself is fasting. And I think that this leads us to a very important thing, which is the purpose. What is the purpose of fasting? And it is so profound that Jesus uses a marriage metaphor for fasting. Because when I first read that, I thought, Jesus, stay on topic. (laughs) The question's about fasting, and then you're like the bridegroom and the wedding, and you're like, what in the world? But listen to this. If you know that you're going to be married to somebody, and you have the date set, and all you want to do is be married, and then you're separated for a season, this is not hypothetical for some of you, how do you feel? Do you, are you apathetic? Eh, we'll get married eventually. Yeah, it'll, it'll happen. It's no big deal. Are you? No. You're longing for that day. You can't get that person out of your mind. You actually kind of ache with a kind of hunger for that person. In fact, there is nothing in your current life that really truly satisfies you because you want so bad to be with them and nothing you do satisfies that longing. That is the point of fasting. Is to be closer to Christ. to to hunger for him, to cultivate our longing to be with Jesus. And the reason that fasting practically helps with this, I believe, is because this ache that we call hunger, which I know we've all felt, sort of gives tangible expression to the hunger that we feel to be with Jesus. You felt that before? And the reality is that when we can't see Jesus, when Jesus isn't there with us, guess what comes flooding through our eyes and into our hearts and into our affections? Everything else. Our job, our family, politics, social media, hobbies, Netflix, and it is this never-ending stream, no pun intended, that overwhelms our senses and demands our attention constantly. And so fasting is just a way of intentionally saying, I'm going to stop, I'm going to deny certain appetites so that I can have space to hunger, to see, to be nearer to Jesus. And that is the point of fasting. But again, notice the contrast here with the Pharisees. Is that the point of fasting for the Pharisees? Not even close. That's actually a laughable question. They hated Jesus. It had nothing to do with Jesus. Not only did it have much to do with God, honestly, because when Jesus talks about fasting from the Pharisees' perspective, in Matthew chapter 6, he's talking to his disciples and he says, when you fast, by the way, notice, he doesn't say if you fast. He assumes that they will fast. But he says, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. Hypocrite, Greek word, means actor. Don't look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces when they're fasting to be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you fast, not if, but when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, stand up straight, smile, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. See, the point he is making is don't do what you're doing to be a show for people. Do it because you want more of me. Do it to be closer to me, which of course the Pharisees didn't want anything to do with that. And for the Pharisees, it had become a rigid religious ritual they did in order to look better in front of the people. And the point of these verses is they imposed their rigid religious ritual on everybody else. They put it on everybody else. And here's the thing, though, and the reason this is important is what does the Bible say? How often does the Bible say a Christian should fast? The Pharisees had an answer for this. Twice a week. And if you fast once a week, you're half as spiritual as me. That's the idea. And it's funny because Jesus says when you fast, but ironically, he doesn't say when to fast. 
When you fast, and another, um, another example, how long does the Bible say you should fast for? A day, two meals, three meals, a week, 40 days if you're like Jesus. You see, we can talk about fasting and Sabbath and all these things. The Bible gives really good examples, and we should. But I think the reason the Bible doesn't give us the answer to those questions is because God does not want fasting or Sabbath or church attendance or giving to become a mindless, rigid tradition we check off, causing us to lose sight of the why, which in a word is who? Christ, Jesus. He is the why. And you see, the Pharisees made the same mistake with Sabbath. Because Jesus and his disciples are walking through the grain fields. They're enjoying their day of rest. They're they're resting in God. They're, They're together. And, of course, the Pharisees get mad. And this is how Jesus responds. He says to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now we're going to talk about these two verses because I think this is the really the mistake that they were making. But notice, first of all, again, just like with fasting, Jesus doesn't say, oh, what, that old tradition? He doesn't say that. He is simply saying you have twisted the Sabbath into something God never intended it to be. And he came to rescue it from what it had become under the leadership of these Pharisees. And two things that they did, we can see the mistake that they made based on Jesus' statement. The first is, Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now, a couple quick things. First of all, we notice the Sabbath was made by who? The Pharisees? No. And they, would act, they acted that way. I, this is our idea. These are our rules. You obey us. You answer to us. But the Sabbath was made by God. And you actually go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, and you see there that God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, separate, different than other days because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So the Sabbath was made by God, but who was it made for? Man. Not Jews, but man. Made for man at creation. Yes, the Sabbath shows up in the Ten Commandments, but all the way back at creation, this is where this idea for rest started. And here's the point. This was given by God as a gift. Can you say the word gift? Gift. Yeah, this is a season for gifts. Who likes to get a gift? Come on now. Yeah. Oh man, the rest of you are jaded. <laughs> I do too much hand raising. It's like the boy cried wolf. You guys are like, I'm not raising my hand anymore. I'm over it. It's a gift from God. It's given to man in order to serve us, to relieve us, to help us, to encourage us. And that may sound like a surprise, especially when you look at Mark chapter 2 and 3, because There's nothing about the Sabbath in these verses that seems like a gift. It's more like a burden, right? And the reason is because of what the Pharisees had turned it into. Something God never intended. And what did God intend? I think it's this. I think it is that in this non-stop, hyper-productive world where we are defined by how much we can get done in a week, God gives us his permission to rest, to stop. You can stop, not just to take a nap, which is awesome, but to remember that God is the one actually doing the work. God is the one providing for our needs. Deuteronomy 5.15, there's a bunch of verses, I'm just going to do one. God says this to his people, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Boy, I don't want to remember that. But it's important, remember you were a slave and that the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. In other words, we remember God's salvation, his his deliverance, his intervention in our life. And he says, as if out of the blue, therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. And again, you're kind of like, well, what do those two have to do with each other? I think what it is, is that we stop in order to fight the temptation to think that we are saving ourselves. That it is my power. It is our innovation as a country. It is our technology. It is my productivity that has moved me forward. And all of that stuff is wonderful stuff. But God is saying, I want you to stop and remember, I am the one who delivered you. 
I am the one who gives you the ability to make technological advances. That's not you. It's me. I've made you for this. Because you see, there are many people who would say, and I grew up in a church that was, if you said Sabbath, you probably got in trouble. It was so, you didn't even talk about it. And they would basically say, we don't need that anymore. And I would just say, if you're there, how's that going for you? How is that I can keep on pushing mentality working out for you? How is your soul? Do you feel like you have a robust sense of the goodness of God and remembering? Or is it more about how much you can get done? That was convicting to me this week. But we stop to remember it's God who's working in my life. And that is the true meaning of Sabbath, friends. That is the gospel. Is that we rest from our works We rest from trying to please God, to to make God happy with us so one day we stand before God and maybe He'll be impressed with us. That is not what the Bible talks about. And the Sabbath, the spiritual Sabbath, the reality of the Sabbath is that we stop working our way and trying to work our way to God and we enter in to the work that Jesus did on the cross for us. We enter into His rest. We rest in His righteousness. Not striving to earn our own. That is the whole picture and purpose of the Sabbath. It is all about Christ. And yet for the Pharisees, it was not about Christ. It was about rules and fact. That is why we read these verses in the Sabbath does not seem like a refreshing gift to encourage people. And the reason is because they had constructed, the Pharisees had constructed this elaborate system of rules and laws, over 600 laws, to tell people exactly what they could and could not do on this day. So rather than the Sabbath serving man, man was being asked to serve this twisted version of the Sabbath. By the way, this, this all happened because the Pharisees had a mindset that they were Lord of the Sabbath. You see, that kind of comes out in their statement. They made the rules. You know how you say, I don't make the rules, I just enforce them? Anybody? Yeah. The Pharisees made them and enforced them. They had made themselves Lord over this. And so Jesus comes and says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I am in charge. I tell my disciples what they can and can't do. Not you. And one of these Sabbath laws, I had to share at least one out of the 600 plus is this, quote, ancient rabbis taught that on the Sabbath a man could not carry something in his right hand or in his left hand across his chest or on his shoulder, but you could carry something with the back of your hand. So I'm going to illustrate with a pen. Oh, I can't do it. Okay. With the back of your hand or with your foot. There's some kids playing hacky sack out there. And I was like, guys, you're okay. It's the Sabbath. (laughs) Or with your elbow, I'm not even going to try, or in your ear, um, or with your hair, bummer for, I'm, I'm still reading the quote, or the hem of your shirt, or your shoe, or your sandal. Now, we're just scratching the surface of the silliness, but this was not silly for them. This was serious. And that is why it had become such an oppressive day. Rather than a day to rest and to remember and to delight in God, it was this day of walking on eggshells. And honestly, guys, it isn't really hard for me to understand how the Pharisees got to this place because I think that churches and religious leaders do it all the time. And what happens is we, we have an honest, sincere desire for people to honor God. Let's say it starts with that, which is good. But what happens when you see people in the church not honoring God? Do you talk about and and seek to cultivate a heart that wants to honor Jesus? Or do you lay down regulations for what people can and can't do? This is maybe a bad example, but a modern day equivalent I'll just throw out is that let's say I have a desire for us not to watch inappropriate movies or TV shows. That's not a bad desire, right? But instead of talking about what the Bible says, about what we put in our minds and our hearts and how that affects us and how that actually can undermine our intimacy with Jesus, I would instead stand up on a Sunday and say, no one is allowed to watch anything more than PG. How would that feel? 
Just put yourself there. It's, it's awkward. I almost don't want to let that moment linger because <laughs> it's so awkward. I just put that on you. Serve that rule. Another example is I'm looking at the budget and I'm thinking, man, it's lower than if everyone gave 10%. But rather than then talking about biblical giving or, or a heart of generosity that could lead us well beyond 10%, I stand up on Sunday and say, everyone needs to give 10% and I'm going to check every week to make sure you do. How do you feel? It's not a gift, is it, anymore? Giving isn't fun anymore, is it? And we laugh at that, but there are churches and then many that have the name of Jesus that operate this way all the time. And they hold people to that rule, to that measurement. And the point is, Jesus comes and he puts the kibosh on that whole way of thinking. And he comes and he says, the Son of Man is Lord. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. I can lead people in how to honor me where God's word doesn't specifically dictate. I can take charge of this. Don't worry, I got this, Pharisee. I don't need your help. And what this means that Jesus is Lord, it doesn't mean we don't talk about fasting. It doesn't mean we don't talk about the Sabbath or what that could mean for us. It doesn't mean we don't do some of those things even together as a church. What it means is that we trust that Jesus is Lord and knows how to lead people. Amen? He knows how to show people when to fast and how long they should fast and for what purposes they choose to fast. And in the case of the, the Sabbath, a really great example from modern day, very real today, is, is the day of the week that you should meet on. That is a hot, hot topic for some people. But honestly, I'm just gonna say, I think it's just bringing Pharisee forward into the modern day. Because Paul specifically uses this language of trusting Jesus with people's decisions in this area. He says in Romans 14, one person considers one day as better than another, while another considers all days alike. Imagine that. Nothing is special. It's all special. And he doesn't say, well, this person's right, this person's wrong. He says each person should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. Notice that. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains and doesn't eat, there's a broader context of eating food we won't go into, but the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. See, this is the whole point of the passage that it's not about fasting or Sabbath or showing up on Sunday morning or 10%. It is about a desire to honor Christ. It's about a, a longing and a hunger to see Him glorified. And if that's 10%, great. If it's 20, if it's 50, that's between you and Jesus. And that is, I think, the whole point. And that is what the Pharisees missed. They had these old wineskins on their shelf that they cherished. <laughs> but no substance. And what does Paul say in Colossians 2? He says, don't let anyone judge you based on what you eat or drink or regarding festivals or new moon celebrations or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is found in Christ. See, friends, I think that the whole key to these verses that we read this morning, and we're going to close with this, is in Verse 21 and 22 of Mark 2. If you're still open there, look down at that with me. Where Jesus says, No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, and the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins. The wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. Now, do you notice any repeated words in there? Yeah. You can tell a lot about repeated words. If I stood up and said, man, I am, I am so frustrated because it's so hot. I just wish it wasn't as hot. And, and, and if I wasn't so hot, I'd be happy. You know, if I walked out, you'd be silly to be like, I wonder what's bugging him. You know, <laughs> I think he's hot, right? And so Jesus knew, and the old, and the new, and the old, and the new, and the old. And I think the point that he's making here is the Pharisees were clinging to their old wineskins. These religious vessels that, that possibly served some purpose in the past, but over time had become rigid and inflexible and quite simply unable to accommodate the new work of God. 
manifested in the Son of God, Jesus. There was no stretch left, right? There was no flexibility. There was no openness to what Jesus was saying or doing. And friends, the more I thought about these words, it, it hit me, and you can disagree with me on this. That's okay. But I think the Pharisees are the old wineskins. I think that's what Jesus is ultimately saying in chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus looked around at them with anger, mixed with grief. You see how sad Jesus is that they're missing out on all that God wants to do for them and in them. But he's angry and he's grieved at their what? Hardness of heart. I want you to do this with your hands. Just join me. Rigid, stiff, unable to respond to what Jesus is doing. And now I want you to compare that reaction to the man who stretched out his hand and was healed. You do this with me? Powerful word, stretched. As the worship team comes forward, you have in front of these Pharisees a living, breathing example of the opposite of what they were doing. See, they had these hearts that were closed off to what Jesus was saying, to what Jesus wanted to do in them and for them, and that's why Jesus grieved. He was sad and he was mad and it was just this mix of human emotion because all they had to do was respond. But they had these hard, rigid hearts. And I think there's a reason why Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, come over here. Jesus didn't just say, you're healed, go on your way so I can keep on with this conversation. No, they, he was a big part of this conversation. Come over here. Stretch out your hand. And right there in front of the Pharisees, they could see the opposite of what they were doing. This man, he could have said, no, 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 I have a shriveled hand. I'm going to be this way till I die. But he didn't. He trusted Jesus. He, he, he was willing to expand. He was willing to stretch. He, he said, okay, Jesus, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. And he stretched out his hand. He was healed. And the shame is rather than being like, wow, amazing, Jesus, the Pharisees, that was it for them. Now they're trying to kill him. Why? They're not going to stretch. Remember the last time Jesus drank and ate with his disciples, he said to them, this is my blood which is poured out for you. And I think Jesus is saying here, I am the new wine. I am the fragrant tasting work of God. I am the substance and I have come down and will come in and pour myself into whoever is willing to receive me. Do you hear that today? But you have to be willing, and I have to be willing for some stretching, right? Because God doesn't just come in and adapt to our rigid form. He changes us. He stretches us. And sometimes it, it hurts. <laughs> but the end result is what? New wine. Jesus in us and through us and flowing out of us. And I want to just close with two questions for you guys this morning. Are you a new or an old wineskin? I'm not trying to insult any of you. By the way, you may perhaps because of your health or your age say I'm an old wineskin. <laughs> but I want to point out here, Jesus isn't talking about age. He doesn't say old and young. He says old and new. And I think that's really significant because there are people I know at this church that have been around since day one of this church that are some of the most vibrant, faith-filled, inspiring people I know. They have a new mindset even though they may not be young. But the question basically is what is the condition of your heart? Is there any flexing going on? Any stretching, any, anything that God is doing to bring about change? Or do you feel hard, unresponsive? Number two, are there any old wineskins in your life? And this gets back to those practices or those, those habits, those traditions, those ways of thinking that are keeping you from being able to receive the fullness of Christ in your life. 
the fullness of all that God wants to pour into you. And what's happened is you have just sort of the mindless rituals, but it's kind of lost its connection to the person of Jesus. Anything? My prayer for us is that as we think about these questions, we won't cling to what we've always done. Maybe it's in your marriage, and maybe you say, well, it's just who I am. That's this, guys. How about you try stretching? <laughs> See what God will do. Maybe it's parenting. Maybe it's in our lives, in our church. What is it that we're saying, I'm not going to let go of that? And I would pray that we would be willing to open up to receive Christ and the work that he wants to do. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we want to taste. As David wrote, we want to taste and we want to see that the Lord is good. Lord, we were never made for religious ritual, which at the end of the day is only designed to make us try to feel better about ourselves, but has nothing to do with seeing your glory. We want to see. We want to taste. We want that new wine, Lord. We want to grow. We want to swell. We want you to fill us. And Lord, that your divine fermentation process would bring us to a place where we are more spirit-filled than we've ever been before. Lord, we need you. We know that this is a fermentation process that only you can bring about, only you can do. So we humble ourselves before you and ask that you would stretch, you would change, you would fill us. We pray all of this, Jesus, in your great name. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and sing, and then we'll close.